A very good evening to all of you. Today, the Internal Quality Assurance Cell of Bethune College, Kolkata, is initiating the first webinar of the webinar series titled Thoughts and Reflections in the Time of COVID-19, Science, Economy, Polity, and Culture. The topic of today's webinar is SARS-CoV-2 virus and health issues. It is a matter of pride for us that we have three very distinguished guests with us. Professor Shopon Bhattacharya, retired professor, Department of Microbiology, Maulana Azad College, Kolkata. Dr. Shomitro Dotto, neonatal in intensivist and senior consultant pediatrician, Srimuti Ranjana Das, psychologist, counselor, and head, Department of Social Science, Shushila Birla Girls School, Kolkata, and college counselor, Loreto College, Kolkata. It is also a matter of honor and pride for us to share with you all today that Bethun College has ranked 88th in the National Institutional Ranking Framework 2020 of the Ministry of Human Resource Development, Government of India, and hence listed as one of the top 100 colleges in India. As per Education World Survey also, Bethun College has been ranked 26th among all the non-autonomous colleges of India. The results came out yesterday, and hence we are really very, very happy. We are trying to put our sincere efforts in carrying on the legacy of excellence of this Heritage College. With this note, I request our principal madam, Professor Krishna Roy, to deliver her welcome. Good afternoon to all of you. Uh, this is the first webinar, and I've requested all my members of IQAC to arrange for such a seminar in this time of lockdown or confinement so that our teachers and students are um, enriched with the knowledge of this sudden pandemic. And so they have arranged for a series of webinars for three consecutive weeks. And I'm happy to see that all the distinguished resource persons are uh, with us and they will deliver their um, expertise knowledge in this area and uh, the students will be benefited and so uh, also we uh, have refreshed our knowledge and um, since this is the first day uh, we have much expectations from the resource persons and since i'm a person from biology uh, all these three lectures, uh, through all these three lectures, I think I will uh, enrich myself. And the first speaker, Professor Bhattacharya, Shapun Bhattacharya, he is an eminent microbiologist uh, for a long time. And he will tell us about the origin, uh, evolution of the virus. And you'll be happy to know that this uh, virus, which is uh, shaking the world throughout, uh, is not a new one. It has been with us for a long time and the other two lectures will be restricted on um, health workers, new challenges and psychological aspects. We are now confined, we are compelled to confine in four walls and just today uh, I've seen that Professor Bhattacharya is also a very good uh, poet and I'm tempted to read out a few lines of his poems recently written. Professor Bhattacharya, I am taking your kind permission. Uh, the name of the poet, I think, Aburuddha Sonnet, I have collected it from his Facebook page. Uh, and this is very pertinent in this, uh, in this uh, current uh, lifestyle, our current lifestyle of confine, confinement. Tomar ki moni hoi manu shatutu eka noi. Kola hall aboshishi boba ashpap moni hoi. Dehir proshnu kichu ar kichu jobabo mamuli on no matu kori. Tabi futati hobby chal guli. Shomuhe ekakaj ami tumi amla shabai. 
এবার নিজের সাথে খোলা মেলা খাঁটি সহবাস চড়ায় ভিজেছে চড়ায় ভিড়েছে ডাঙা ডিঙা নেই পাল না আছে বাতাস তবু সমুদ্র ডাকে ভাঙা মাস্তুল ডাকে যাই সো দিস ইস আওয়ার ডেস্টিনি উই উইল লিভ উইথ করোনা অ্যান্ড উই উইল এনরিচ আওয়ার নলেজ উইথ অল দিস লেকচার থ্যাংক ইউ থ্যাংক ইউ ম্যাডাম Uh, now to carry on with the webinar may i introduce professor shopon bhattacharya professor bhattacharya is a retired professor of microbiology he retired from molana azad college where he founded the undergraduate department of microbiology which proved to be one of the best microbiology departments in the entire eastern india with a star dbt status under his leadership and guidance Professor Bhattacharya has many publications to his credit and presented his research papers in many acclaimed seminars, including the International Botanical Congress in Vienna. He is presently working as a guest faculty in the postgraduate department of microbiology, Lady Raymond College. He is continuously engaged in popularizing science in Bengal. May I now request okay. Professor Shapon Bhattacharya to deliver his lecture. So, a very good evening to all of you uh, uh i want to congratulate principal professor krishna roy and the members of the iqsc and all the teachers of bethun college for achieving a consecutive two two days we got the news that uh, it has been ranked very high college has been ranked very high in the uh, global institutional ranking as well as that of the government of india <clears throat> uh today we are in a new mode of exchange the mode where we all are in our homes either in our reading rooms studies or in our bedrooms and we are hosting this uh seminar which is uh, popularly known as popularly being labeled as webinar and the difference is that uh, i can face my audience uh on the screen the screen also sees me uh, the audience also sees me on screen and there is no high tea low tea or hot lunch dinner etc which are associated with the seminars always uh, and 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 the uh, and the particle which has which has forced us to do this which has forced the particle which has forced us to do so is this novel coronavirus uh where from the story begins we all know the story began uh in china in early december some of the some of some some people who were associated with a live food market in the city of wuhan wuhan is a large city 1.11 is the population and uh, it is capital of hubei province many an industrial city people from all over china come to wuhan uh, like they come in calcutta from different parts of india in early december people who had some link or other with the live food market of wuhan they reported they began reporting the uh, hospitals in wuhan Uh, that they have fever they have kind of tastelessness and they have some breathing problems and the doctors they first search their uh, their repository china has a very good under the skin system for surveillance every 145 billion every person of the 145 billion of uh, people of china is connected with a central communicable disease surveillance system which monitors for 35 communicable diseases in their country so this is under the skin surveillance for everyone uh they found that there is this this uh, this system this software this gave no signal that this is anything new so that is the first trick that is the first incidents of bypass it bypassed a an ai artificial intelligence 
and then they went for metagenic, but there was no sign of any organism or any uh, uh, genomic pattern which is associated with the normal communicability is just there. So they went for next generation metagenomic sequencing and they found that it is a coronavirus indeed. It is this, they call it novel coronavirus. It is very close to the coronavirus which has uh, uh, created havoc in 2002 in China itself. That was known as SARS, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. The virus was known as SARS-CoV. And they named this virus as SARS-CoV-2. The SARS-CoV, they reported, they first made their press on the SARS-CoV-2 on 30th of January. On the, that very same day, they informed who that a new virus has arrived and it is, however, preventable and, and controllable. On 31st, the virus had, could not have a, could not, there could not be, have been a better time for the virus to migrate because 31st Jan December and 1st January also happened to be the Chinese New Year. Chinese New Year or Tet are the, are the greatest fest festivals of the Chinese. This was the Tet holidays. On the Tet holidays, 31st December and in between 31st December and 1st January, 175,000 persons just went out of Wuhan. It could, be, it could be recorded from their mobile data recording. 175,000. Among these 175,000, many went to different cities of China, like Shanghai, like Beijing. Many took planes. 20,000 went to Bangkok. 9,000 went to Seattle. Many went to Australia. Many went to Lombardy, Italy. So they went that, and that, that's how the virus migrated all over the world. However, immediately after that, China uh, stopped uh, flights and China went for this lockdown. This is, this is another part of the story. I'm not going into the details of that. I'm here to uh, tell you about the virus, whatever I know, I'm, what I'm here to share with you. So this is the SARS-CoV-2 very closely related to the SARS-CoV, which, which had caused uh, 2002 uh, severe acute respiratory disease. And there is another uh, killer uh, coronavirus. There was another killer coronavirus, which, uh, created, which uh, made havoc in the Middle East. That was known as MARS-CoV, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome Virus. MARS-CoV, it was of 2013. But coronaviruses were always there. Coronavirus was uh, probably first record of coronavirus was from veterinarians, veterinary surgeons in 1890 in Germany found a strange disease among cats, cats with soul and belly and every kitten died. They, then they found that this is a, this is a, this is a the causal agent is, has, a, has two very, uh, very unique characteristics. One is, is, is its uh, host jumping. The cat virus can infect uh, dog and every pup can die. The rat virus can infect pigs and every piglet will die. And uh, another is tissue tropism. Tissue tropism, that is, it is not restricted to a particular tissue. It can infect lung, it can infect upper respiratory tract, it can infect lower respiratory tract, it can infect brain. It can infect even sperms, testis, ovary, etc. So, uh, tissue tropism and uh, this uh, host jumping, these are two unique characteristics. In 1960, coronavirus could first be, first be observed uh, under an electron microscope. It, its appearance uh, was like a, a circle around which a solar corona-like structure, that's why it was named corona, similar to solar corona. And it has got on its surface spike-like spike -like projections. So this was coronavirus, which is a large virus, member of corona Veridae family. There are four groups in, among the coronavirus, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. Among them, the alpha and beta are capable of infecting humans. Uh, 
gamma is avian coronavirus and delta is both avian and mammalian. Uh, there are seven coronaviruses which can infect humans, which had always been infecting humans. Among them, four are very mild. These four <laughs> are mild coronaviruses are, and they are natural reservoir. Uh, two of them, natural reservoir are rodents, uh, and two are uh, bats. So two from bats and two from rodents could always infect, is there with us, is there in an endemic with us. And they had, uh, from, from a very long time, they had been infecting humans, but they do not cause that severe a symptom uh, as that we are observing today. The first severe human, first uh, incidence of uh, severely affecting human was uh, SARS of 2002. And uh, what's, at that time, it's, it was, uh, its genome was sequenced. Coronavirus is an enveloped virus. And even if you ask a child to draw a coronavirus, the child, he or she will draw a circle around which the spikes. Yes, these spikes are the, actually the power spikes with which the coronavirus detect its host and it is responsible for its infectivity too. I'll come to that point later. And within this envelope, what, what we are, you are observing the, uh, the figures, the diagrams, the photographs, what you are observing is just the envelope and the uh, spikes around it. Inside, it has another part. This part is called nucleocapsid, and this nucleocapsid has its genome. Its genome is RNA. Not DNA, its genome is. It has a genomic RNA. The RNA is plus RNA. What, what, why we call it plus RNA? Because this RNA can act as an mRNA. That is, as soon as it enters the human host or any other host, it will begin uh, uh, transcribing, uh, translating, uh, and form its own proteins. So that is its uh, RNA. The RNA has. We can, we can divide the RNA into two parts. The first part is responsible for producing or coding for 16 non-structural proteins, among which I, I, I'd ask you to remember two. One is RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. RNA-dependent RNA polymerase is responsible for synthesizing or replicating its RNA inside the host. And the other is an exonuclease, a 3-5 three, three, exonuclease, we call it. These two are the important non-structural proteins in the first part. In the second part of the RNA virus are four structural proteins, structural proteins which are responsible for synthesizing spike, for synthesizing membrane proteins, uh, for synthesizing the envelope, uh, and for synthesizing the nuclear capsid. So that's what the two parts of the virus genome is. Now, this, uh, as I said, as this coronavirus, it, its host uh, jumping, infectivity, pathogenicity, and uh, its tissue tropism is controlled by its spike. People tend to call it power spike, it's power spike. Spike, you can, Compare the structure of the spike with that of a clove, a clove flower, clove, lobongo, clove. The spike has two parts. The clove, the flower part of the clove, is the part which binds to the human cells. When it enters the human cell, it will bind to specific receptors on the present on the surface of the human cell. This specific, I'll come to that specific receptor point later. This is the first part of the spike. And the second part is the stem, the stem of the clove. Imagine a clove, the first part, flower part, is the part which comes in contact with the cellular, our cellular receptors. And the second part is, it is embedded in the virus itself, virus uh, envelope itself. The second part, uh, we should call the first part as S1 and the second part as S2. The S1 is responsible for binding two specific receptors present on the host cell surface. 
In case of SARS-CoV-2, this coronavirus, which we are now facing, the specific receptor is ACE2. ACE2 is angiotensin converting enzyme receptor 2. And this ACE2, when it binds to the S1 part, what our cell does as a response, our cell cleaves the S1 part. It is kind of a protective oh, reaction on the part of the cell that it cleaves the S1 part. It cleaves the flower part. As soon as it cleaves the flower, flower part, what happens is the stem of the globe, it undergoes a tissue transformation and it makes a fusion protein. The fusion protein fuses with the cellular envelope and the virus goes into the cell. So recognizing the ACE2 and binding it to the S1 part is the first part of its magic. After the cleavage of the S1 part, the first part of the magic is done and the service is taken over by the S2 part, which now converts, the, converts its membrane, undergoes the transformation, fuses with the cellular membrane and gets in. As soon as the virus gets in, the nucleic acid gets in, the nucleic acid gets uncoated. Uncoating means it, it releases its RNA releases the RNA into the cell, and as soon as the RNA enters the cell, the cell becomes the slave. Cell becomes a slave of the virus. The cell begins to function not in by its own uh, signal, own genetic signal. It forgets its own genetic signal. It begins to recognize every signal the virus gives inside the cell and begins to act as a slave of that virus. It begins to synthesize the virus RNA, synthesize it, it begins to synthesize RNA, begins to synthesize RNA for its own progeny. The RNA, as I said, it is a plus RNA. And we all know, we all with, uh, uh, all with a slight sense of uh, understanding of replication that an, uh, an RNA from an RNA strand, another RNA strand cannot be synthesized. So the first, it, what it does, it forms a replicative form where there is both plus and minus RNA. And from the minus RNA, the plus RNA for its next progeny are synthesized and other proteins are synthesized. It's uh, the particle synthesis, uh, particle proteins are assembled within the cell and within a very short time, the virus is released from the cell and goes on to infect the next cell. That's how it proceeds. Now, in case of SARS-CoV, that is the 2002 SARS virus, the uh, ACE2 binding receptor, S1, which binds the ACE2 receptor on the cell. Uh, this ACE2 uh, binds with S1 all right. That, up to that, the mechanism is all right. But uh, the mechanism by which the S1 was cleaved was somewhat different from that of the SARS-CoV-2, which we are seeing now. In case of SARS-CoV, there was an additional cleavage site on the S2 that is called S2 prime. So it needed both S1 and S2 prime to be cleaved. That's why the SARS-CoV needed a huge load of virus. It didn't quite get its foothold on the upper respiratory tract. It was fatal. SARS-CoV had a 10% mortality but it exhibited its mortality only after it went into the lung. mars of 2013. mars of 2013, yes, it exhibited a similar S1 like that of the SARS-CoV today, but mars was also not very efficient in uh, infecting the upper respiratory tract. It played havoc after entering into the lower respiratory tract, that is on reaching the alveoli, and binding the S2 receptors there. SARS-CoV-2 has best of both ends. It is quite an efficient on the upper respiratory tract uh, and also a very efficient in the lower respiratory tract too, but it depends on the load of the virus, the inoculum volume. If you are close to a person who has a SARS-CoV-2 infection, if droplets continually infect you, if you are 
uh, aerosol infected or if you are suffer from nosocomial infection, if there is a huge viral load, then some of the viruses from the throat through your saliva can get into your lung and infect your lung alveoli there and there it can play havoc. But in 80% of the cases, in many of the cases, its infection is restricted to upper respiratory tract only. That's why the SARS-CoV infection, the patients who are suffering from SARS-CoV-2, this coronavirus infection, which is playing a cover now, exhibit so different symptoms in their body. So different symptoms. And uh, another thing is this, that the SARS-CoV-2 exhibits an S1 cleavage site, which is called which is susceptible to uh, an enzyme which is known as furin. furin. Now, furin is present in HIV. Furin is exhibited, furin uh, cleavage site is exhibited by the HIV. Furin cleavage site exhibited by Ebola. Furin cleavage yes. site exhibited by, yeah. by influenza viruses. Furin cleavage site was never uh, a um, characteristic of uh, SARS-CoV. So this has best of both ends. In case of SARS-CoV, the evolution could be traced uh, from bat, from bat to uh, uh, before that. I'm, I, I just give, I, I just give, uh, uh, want to give an idea that how this evolution could be traced. There is a and there is a there is a separate branch which is which is called peri paleovirology. Paleovirology is traced by evolution of the viruses through the uh, through their uh, progression through the mutations they are accumulating in their uh, genome and so on and so forth and coronavirus with coronavirus paleo paleo uh, virologists they have detected that that earlier the primi primitive coronavirus did not have any have any uh, uh, cleavage site did not have S at all. So in, at that time, the coronaviruses just uh, were neurotropic. Where whatever coronaviruses could enter the body through the neural system. Thereafter, it acquired the S2. Thereafter, by, by uh, gene capturing, it produced the S1, S1 uh, in terminal site. And thereafter, by gene duplication, it acquired the S1 uh, uh, C, C terminal site. So, that is an evolution which has taken place over a long period of time. How long? How long? In 1890, as I said, 1890 was the first report of coronavirus. But coronavirus might be there. Uh, the paleovirus say that maybe from 10,000 to uh, 3 billion years ago, the coronaviruses were there. And there were, uh, were uh, coronaviruses which uh, primitive coronaviruses that traced from pangolins, from pangolins, basically zoonotic, from pangolins, there is a line of evolution, which ultimately bifurcated into a bat coronavirus, bat, BAT, bat coronavirus, bat are natural reservoirs, they have 61 types of coronaviruses, but they do not suffer because bats, bat cells do not give the distress signal when infected by coronavirus. No, only uh, so there is a there is a diversion, there is a bifurcation of coronaviruses from bat strain to the uh, human strain. No, so no, human no. human strain is a late development. In case of SARS coronaviruses, the coronaviruses uh, uh, before that. Another thing is the coronaviruses can undergo uh, oh, nice. mutation. The mutation at its uh, RNA dependent RNA replication moiety is a good target for drugs, should be a good target for drugs. Because if you can stop its RNA synthesis, you can stop the growth of the virus. But it has mutations there. That's why the drugs like remdesivir or other antivirals are ineffective. Hmm. So if, we, if those drugs which cannot bind to the uh, it's RNA dependent RNA polymerase enzyme site. How the drug will become effective? It cannot act there. So, second mode of choice of drug should be the drugs which can induce mutation. 
which can induce mutation and lower down the probability of the virus viral growth in the cell. This virus, SARS-CoV-2, has a unique property of proofreading. That is, drugs like ribavirin, if they're treated with drugs like ribavirin, which, which are actually nucleotide mimics, the drugs like ribavirin can mimic the nucleotide, enter into the RNA, and cause the RNA to stop uh, uh, replicating. It can, uh, if you Mutation. apply drugs which cause, can cause mutation, then also it is ineffective because it has the proofreading mechanism. By proofreading, it can find out the errors and cleave that wrong base from there. That's why the drugs like Rivavirin are ineffective. So, SARS-CoV has best or worst of both ends. It has a furin site which is not there in SARS. So, where from this SARS-CoV has originated? Uh, probably from bats to another, uh, another uh, uh, organism, another uh, animal in which a recombination has taken place. Which can this organism, which can this animal be? No, that is the last puzzle yet to be solved. It has not been solved yet. But one thing is sure that the recombination has taken place because, because the SARS-CoV spike has, SARS-CoV itself has 96% similarity with that of the bat coronaviruses. But bat coronavirus spike is quite different from that of the SARS-CoV. SARS-CoV genome has a 90% similarity, not very significant, 90% similarity with that of the pangolin coronavirus. But pangolin spike is exactly that like of the SARS-CoV spike. So a recombination between these two has taken place in an animal. We don't know where, but from that, it has come into human beings and causing this havoc. And it, at present, we are in a nowhere country. Only thing we can say that its genome is stable. Because its genome is stable, it is not, it is not unlike influenza viruses. If a vaccine arrives, that vaccine will be uh, uh, quite a stable vaccine, unlike that of the influenza virus. And secondly, like other coronaviruses, which have become endemic over a period of time, this will also become endemic. People say that OC43, one very docile coronavirus which is there within us now. In 1890, it was a very virulent one. 1890 influenza epidemic, which killed 10 million people of the earth, was probably caused by OC43, which is quite a docile now. So might be over a period of time, it will be docile, it will be neutralized. Our body system will manage, will get and hold over it. With these words and with, con with congratulations to IQAC, Veteran College in principal, and all other guests here. Uh, that's it. Uh, if there is any question, I'm happy to answer. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Now move on to uh, our next speaker. And before that, may I introduce Dr. Dotto to all our viewers. Dr. Shomitra Dotto is a senior consultant pediatrician and neonatal intensivist based at Bhagirothi Neutia Hospital in town. After completion of primary training and post-graduation in Kolkata, doctor moved to the UK. He trained in several, re several regional and tertiary institutes in England for 10 years. Birmingham and Sheffield Children's Hospital are just a few of the APEX institutes he worked at. He has been extensively trained in neonatal and pediatric intensive care and has many researches and publications to his credit. Dr. Dotto believes in the human element of clinical medicine that is so, so much lacking in the modern sophisticated world of investigative medicine. He loves to treat the babies and children holistically rather than treat the disease. To him, Life is a journey of glorious uncertainties and impedances. 
And the job of a pediatrician is to hold the helm of the ship on its way through the stormy sea. Apart from this, on a personal note, I must say that he is a wonderful person and a wonderful, wonderful photographer. So over to Dr. Shobhito Doctor. Thank you, Moitri, for your kind words. And uh, I'm really overwhelmed and uh, I'm very much grateful for uh, you to bring me on this panel uh, along with esteemed speakers. And I'm really obliged to, uh, to know uh, Prof. Bharacharya today and hear his lecture. It was brilliant. And thank you very much for that. Uh, well, uh, I don't pursue to give a lecture today. I mean, I don't think this is a forum for a lecture. I think here we are here to discuss a few things about Corona. And I am pretty sure a lot of people who already know a lot about the COVID-19 situation at this present uh, uh, time. And, uh, you know, we need to talk uh, very much uh, uh, on the things that are existing right at this point of time from a medical point of view. And what are the things that we can do in order to sort of alleviate the problems that is uh, possible? Of course, we'll be talking about vaccines, as a lot of people are talking. Uh, so we'll be talking about uh, other things also. But basically, very in a very short, uh, you know, nutshell, I would say that Corona or COVID nineteen presents uh, in quite it, it's quite it's quite heterogeneous. I mean, in eighty percent of the uh, people, it will not show any signs of infection, and that also varies from place to place in the world. I mean, in certain areas of the world, it would show up an asymptomatic carrier would be as high as eighty percent. In some uh, sort of uh, populations, it would be around about fifty to sixty percent. But what is very important is most of us who are ultimately going to harbor the uh, coronavirus will not suffer a lot. That's number one. Number two is there may be uh, an uncomplicated illness, and that's a very big thing. An uncomplicated illness is mostly causing a little bit of fever, a little bit of headache, maybe a little bit of sore throat, and that's about it. That's almost about 40% of those who are affected. A mild pneumonia may be presented. Some, a severe pneumonia is about in 5%, and ultimately the full-blown adult respiratory distress syndrome that we, got, we talk about ARDS, and that's a very bad state. So ARDS is ultimately sort of manifested in only about 5% of the population. Some of the ARDS ultimately get an infection and there's a disseminated sepsis. So you might also get a sepsis-like state. You might also get a person in the tertiary stages running into a septic shock when, you're, when you have severe hypotension, severe breathlessness, and even the, the, the best of ventilation and the best of vasopressors are not able to sort of help and ultimately you sort of, uh, you, you, you sort of fall over and you die. But that's a small percentage. But very surprising are a few facts. Number one is there's a total heterogeneity of the effects of the virus. In certain countries, it has been really moribund. And the sort of uh, the fatality rates have propped up, up to about eight to ten percent. In some countries, the fatality rates have been around about two to three percent. We don't yet know, though we know so much about the virus. But actually, what we don't know is the behavior of the virus. And really, that's the problem. That's the reason we in England, my we have. I was recently uh, sort of doing a webinar there, and in England, very surprisingly. The deaths which have opened, happened to all the doctors have been only Asians. None of the white doctors, they have been affected, but none of them sort of have died. Most of the nurses who have died in, in the UK have been Filipino nurses. Why? We don't know. So once again, the behavior of the virus is bizarre. And until unless we really understand uh, the behavior, Along with the morphology, we will not be able to tackle the virus, I believe so. Now, um, there are a few things that I need to uh, talk about. Is We keep on talking medically about the effect of lockdown and why we did and why we ultimately went for a lockdown. Is lockdown the, the cure for the virus? Is it, is it sufficient to certainly curtail the spread of the virus? The answer to that is possibly no. Because there are many countries in the world who have opted out of the lockdown and have done wonderfully. There are uh, countries in the world who have done wonderfully with the lockdown also. So we don't yet have an answer. But what is very important 
this lockdown can only defer, it can only defer the manifestations of the virus effect in the society so that you get adequate time, uh, time about three weeks, four weeks, six weeks, so that you can prepare your country to sort of withstand the insult that is going to be caused by the virus. So that's the time when you develop your health infrastructure. And that's the time you look out for the space that you are going to provide. So when we are talking about health infrastructure, that's what I'm in. And that's what my main topic of talking today would be, is how do you sort of, you know, how do you cater your society, cater your medical equipments, medical services, whatever you have, how do you do it? You do it by looking at number one, space. So you need three sorts of spaces for COVID patients. Number one, outdoor centers. They will be simple outdoor centers where people come for, to see a doctor, they're diagnosed or not, not diagnosed COVID and they're sent back home. Number two, are the COVID hospitals. When the patients have come with symptoms which mimic COVID, so you are put in there, you are, you are offered tests, you are tested. If you are positive, you are there. If you are not uh, positive, you go back home. Number three is the tertiary COVID centers. The tertiary COVID centers are those uh, places where we treat COVID uh, with, with, with complications like severe pneumonia, RDS, septic, septic shock syndromes, and that sort of stuff. And lastly, of course, there are quarantine centers. I'm not going to talk about them. But the best place for quarantine possibly is home, provided people listen to the quarantine rules. And the rules are very specific. They are all embedded by the government of India. They are all there on the national guidelines. And there's no dispute about what quarantine should be. You must identify the personnel, the doctors, the nurses, the paramedics, the ancillary staff, the support system which is present. And unfortunately, we don't have them. This is a big, 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 mega, mega sort of caveat that we have nowadays. We don't have enough doctors. If you, you would be surprised to know that in a tertiary COVID hospital, I'm not going to tell the name, in Kolkata, we are uh, catering a, a six uh, floor building with only about three to four doctors. And they are also inadequately equipped, unfortunately. The PPEs are given only once a day, and they, you cannot live in a PPE for six hours, you have to understand. The moment you take your PPE off, you have to throw it up. You can't, you've got to discard it, because PPEs are, cannot be reused over and over again. The moment you have some food, you have to take your PPE off, have food, and then it's gone. So those PPEs are not replaced. So that's a problem. That's a major problem. So you wouldn't find. Uh, the ancillary staff are not trained. Handling of COVID patients is of utmost importance. And the way you handle them is not taught. So that is what was supposed to be done during the lockdown period. And we missed that, that window of opportunity. The equipment, the PPE masks, the gowns, the headgear, the goggles, the sanitizers, the beds, the monitoring equipment, the ventilators. Whenever we talk about COVID, we talk about ventilators. No, no, no. Ventilators are necessary only for a, to deal with about 1 to 2% of the patients. But most importantly, we need specific PPEs. We need to know the way to wear a PPE, how to discard a PPE. Who are the people who should be wearing a PPE? You should have, you, there are guidelines which are not being followed. The ancillary support, the labs, the type of test that we should be doing. We were doing different sorts of tests at different periods of time. Now we have come down at least to an RT-PCR test, which is reasonably reliable. But even then, there is a 30% false negative. So that, you know, that's, that's a big, big caveat once again. And as far as antibody tests are concerned, they are not very much reliable right at this point of time. They will be able to actually judge the prognosis as well as the course of the disease and the sort of immunity status of the child or the person, whoever is suffering from that. So antibody tests needs to be more sophisticated before they become implemented. The transport of patients, we don't have committed COVID ambulances. We don't know how to get those patients from the home to the, to the hospitals. First of all, where are the hospitals? I mean, there are two sectors of hospitals. One is on the government sectors and the other one is the private sectors. The private sectors are government are, are hospitals where part of the sector, of the hospital sector has been converted into a COVID hospital. Of course, that means it is not 
as equipped as it should be, ideally. It may be equipped infrastructure-wise, but as far as the manpower is concerned, as far as the people who are supposed to handle the COVID patients are not trained. I mean, they don't know. Even a simple thing like a collection of sample, a collection of a nasopharyngeal swab is to be done in an appropriate way. A throat swab has to be collected in an appropriate way. So where is the training for these people who are handling it? Some of them are doing even without PPs and not only PPs, how to wear a PP is of immense importance. You need to know that. The disposables, the disposition of the, of the instruments which are present, where are they present? In England, most of the OTs or the operation theaters have been converted into COVID uh, intensive care units. We haven't done that. That was a fantastic idea that they did. And actually that did a lot in Germany also to curb the number of deaths. How did they increase the number of ventilators so much in such a short time? It's because of the fact they incorporated all the ventilators which were used in the OT. They didn't manufacture them. They just got them over from the OT because every hospital has, has got at least about three to four OTs. And each OT is so big that it can be easily separated. Even our private OTs are so big, they can at least uh, hold on to about three patients. So you can imagine the number of OTs which could have been converted into, you could have kept one single OT for uh, a standard procedure or an emergency procedure and the rest would have been converted. So we didn't do all these things. The trans, the pharmacy, the medicines, hydroxychloroquine was rampantly sold initially and then went out of stock. The emergency medicines, which are, which are very of immense use in intensive care, for example, the low molecular weight heparin, they just disappeared out of the blue. They are very important. The press and the media handling wasn't nice. I mean, the fact is, there needs to be a strong monitoring agency, somebody in command with a plan, and that has to be implemented. And that is exactly what we have to do now. Whatever I have said just now, regarding the infrastructure and the deficiencies in the infrastructure, is not to show, is not to show what has gone wrong, but to show you that this is the thing that we need to do. This is the way forward that we need to do that. So we need to build up the infrastructure. We need to build up the space, train the personnel, get the equipment, get the ancillary support, and also arrange for the, actually the, the labs, the pharmacies, the, the hospital supplies, the essential services, the accounts, the finances, the, the press, the media handling, and also looking at the same time at the data because data is of primary importance, you know. Until or unless the data is absolutely clear and transparent, you will not know where we are going. We will not be able to publish anything later on. And not only that, you know, if there is a paucity of data, then the resources which should be actually provided depending on the data present will be deficient. So the data, presentation of the data, and the quality control of the, you know, of the medical services and the paramedical services which are rendered should be appropriate. So these are the things that I, I thought I would need to sort of uh, highlight. A couple of small points. Number one is what would you do? Say, for example, I'm pretty sure in days to come, there will be COVID patients right, left and center. Even the person next door will have COVID. So what are you supposed to do that? That is a very important. I am not going into the details of personal protection. I'm not going into the details of hygiene and you know, wearing masks and you know, one meter distance and all that. We all know about that. We know enough of that. You know, I'm not going into the, those are of utmost importance and I'm pretty sure everybody is aware of those procedures. So I'm not going into those details right now, but those are absolutely imperative. They're not essential. They are imperative. Each of us, you cannot roll out on the streets. You cannot roll out on the streets. Even though lockdown is over, you cannot just go ahead, have a cup of tea or at, the, at, the, at the tea corner. You can't do it. I mean, that's, that's, not, that's not done. Until unless we really want a catastrophe and we are almost in a catastrophe now. That's not. So what happens if we are diagnosed COVID? That's for you to know. Number one is you need to test yourself. Only one good thing which has happened now, very recently, is that there are certain private labs which are open now 
for COVID examination. So you can go into a few of the private labs which are prevalent in Kolkata now. You can go and get a COVID test with a prescription by your doctor. So that's number one. That's a positive way ahead. The reports are usually available within 24 hours. They normally inform you over the phone. And once you are positive, unfortunately, the first thing to do is to consult a doctor. It does not necessarily that you have to go and see the doctor. In fact, I would advise you not to see the doctor until and unless you have sufficient symptoms pertaining to the respiratory tract, whether it's upper respiratory tract or lower respiratory tract. In other words, if you have very high fever, if you have got very bad cough, if you have got breathlessness, if you have got a dizzy sensation in your head and you're not feeling well and you're extremely weak, if your sleep pattern gets you know, uh, altered, if you're having delirium, so in other words, you're speaking irrelevant things out of place, if you're not able to judge things, if you're not able to concentrate, these are the danger symptoms. If you're vomiting profusely, if you're very lethargic, unusually lethargic, these are the signs when you need to go to a hospital which deals with COVID cases, whether it is on the government sector, or on the private sector. I'm sure they, will deal, they will deal with you separately mm-hmm. and they will take you to a flu room where they are going to test you and they will send samples. Okay. And you will be admitted. If you have got these symptoms, you should be admitted. The problem is paucity of beds. Whether you're going to get a bed at all is a matter of debate. And that's exactly what's what uh, is absolutely the turbulent condition in Delhi right now. But the fact is that's the only situation. And that's the only thing you can do. The second thing, second very important, is the moment you are diagnosed that to have COVID, you should definitely isolate yourself, even if you're in home quarantine, and that's possibly the best quarantine possible. So if you don't have symptoms and signs, if you are on mild symptoms and signs, a little bit of cup, a little bit of cold, you keep an eye on yourself, talk to your home physician, talk to your doctor, and also keep yourself confined to a single room if it is possible. There should not be anybody else in the room if it is possible. Your food and other things should be provided separately and possibly in things which can be discarded. I mean, in other words, reusable things should uh, should not be used. You should not definitely communicate with seniors who are present. Of course, as you know, that older people, elders, as well as uh, people with diabetes, with hypertension, with cerebrovascular disease, who have heart operations, you know, these are, and also kids, you know, these are the people who you need to avoid. You should definitely indulge in washing your hands as many times as you can, definitely before using the toilet, after using the toilet, before having food, when, while you're opening the door or you're closing the door, all the time, you should use a hand sanitizer, wear a mask at home, If you are a COVID patient, you must wear a mask at home. And the people who are going to take care of you will have to have a proper, uh, will have to take proper care of themselves. If they can be offered a PP, that's fantastic, but it's very difficult to do at home. So I wouldn't advise that. As far as, um, you know, there have been a few questions about vaccines. Okay. Um, There have been questions about, uh, uh, you know, how can you prevent COVID? There's a lot of, uh, a thing going on in the social media about taking vitamins, vitamin C, zinc, vitamin D, and uh, you know uh, things like homeopathic medicines. To be honest with you, there has been clean-cut guidelines given by uh, the All India Institute of Medical Sciences as well as the government of India that there is no, and I explicitly say, there is no proof of a single medicine which can definitely increase in your or boost your immunity. Or, increase, or reduce your susceptibility to the COVID virus. Of course, your innate immunity, which you possess, and I'm pretty sure, and Professor Bharacharya is going to agree with me, that in days to come, that is one of the ways to look forward when about more than 70% of the population gets affected, and ultimately being it an mRNA virus, RNA virus, that you would be possibly be able to get some herd immunity out of it. And that's how possibly the virus would die a silent death if not a death, at least uh, would go into hibernation. But whatever it is, there is no single medicine which is de- definitely does help. Hydroxychloroquine, which was suggested, has had two different types of reports. The first report, and still being suggested by the ICMR, is only to be given to 
people who are treating COVID and in the vicinity of COVID. In other words, those people who are handling COVID cases, they or their relatives or the people who are exposed to COVID can have a hydroxychloroquine dosage as per ICMR guidelines. Now, definitely hydroxychloroquine along with some other medicines, antivirals, are definitely proving in some studies to be effective, though there is not a consensus about this as far as vaccines are concerned. And that's a very important topic because that's possibly our only ray of hope. And the good news is that there are almost about 150 groups all over the world who are working for the vaccines and of them 10 have entered the clinical trials of whom about four of them and they are premier ones have entered a phase two and even a phase three trial so that's the last stage the last hurdle and among them the oxford group which uh, fortunately is actually uh, uh, coupled with the Serum Institute of India, which is the largest producer, production, producer of the vi uh, vaccines in the world, actually, by bulk I'm talking about. So SII, or Serum Institute of India and Oxford, have, are producing the virus. And in fact, it is assumed that the news in the grapevine is that they are starting production of the vaccine within two to three weeks from now, which is fantastic. That's one good news. But once again, some trials in Oxford have not been as they had uh, anticipated. So they are going through a second, which is a 2B stroke 3 trial, which are, they are doing for two uh, types of vaccines, which supposedly will also sort of combat other viruses, like viruses, uh, which are going to be, it will be a common joint sort of, you know, antiviral uh, vaccine. And that is going into clinical trials in July, in, in June, with the inclusion of children. So that was one of the things which was, um, uh, which was missing. So that is one thing. Of course, uh, the Johnson & Johnson one, they are starting clinical trials in July uh, in USA and Belgium, about uh, 1,000 patients. But the most, uh, 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 most happening one also is uh, the China, China one, which has a Chinese Beijing uh, one, which has almost uh, completed the second uh, phase of trials. And they say, that they will release it for an emergency basis by the end of October. So by the end of October, we are expecting to get a Chinese vaccine. E.L. Lilly is another one. Uh, they should be also going into the, uh, uh, they, are, they are actually doing an antibody trial. And uh, that is also reasonably good. And uh, Moderna of USA, that's another, uh, they are also doing an uh, RNA, sort of encapsulated mRNA. They are also in the phase two trial and the final stage is to be started in July. So once again, many uh, vaccines are in the pipeline. Many of them will be successful. Uh, how soon you get, possibly, I'm looking at around about end of uh, October to be the earliest, but uh, presumably by that time, a lot of damage would have been done. So that is the sad news. As far as other therapies are concerned, well, we are talking a lot about uh, antivirals. And of course, Prof has already spoken about the antivirals. I'm not going to say a word about them because he, he's exhaustively talked about them and why and how they could be working. So that's uh, fantastic. Of course, Remdesivir would be possibly the best one of the whole lot that's going to work. And there's rationa rationality also behind that. The last thing I would uh, touch is plasma uh, sort of uh, therapy. Plasma therapy has definitely proved of benefit. But once again, the, we are not in a state, it's still being used in an experimental stage and it is not to be used beyond experiment as far as the government of India guidelines are there. In New York, they have started on plasma therapy as a primary one in those who have gone into uh, ARDS stage two or stage three. Uh, they, are, uh, start, they have started it and they have actually got an FDA uh, uh, license for it also. Just they have gotten a license for hydroxychloroquine. A wonderful combination of hydroxychloroquine along with azithromycin is being used nowadays in quite a few countries over the world. Japan specifically is using it quite rampantly and they have found success. But once again, no medicines have been proven beyond doubt and unanimously to be absolutely effective in the treatment of this COVID-19. 
And that's about it. I would be happy to answer any questions. And thank you once again, Moitri, for providing me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Dotto. A wonderful, wonderful, wonderful lecture. And so very, very informative as well. So as suggested by you, we would take the questions at the end of the seminar. So I think we should move on to our third speaker. Uh, we would now uh, move on to our third speaker, Srimuthi uh, Ranjana Das. And may I introduce Srimuthi Das to all our viewers. Srimuthi Ranjana Das has been a long uh, teaching, has a long teaching uh, uh, career for about 21 years. She has been teaching psychology and is acting as the head of uh, the social sciences department at Shushila Billa Girls School, Kolkata. She's also the college counselor of College Kolkata. She has been counseling and treating people for quite some time and has founded an institution for mental health. She is actively engaged in generating awareness regarding mental health among people, particularly among the young generation. May I now request Srimuthi Das to deliver her lecture. Madam Das, please. Good evening uh, to all the esteemed guests who are here. And a very warm welcome to the panelists. What a brilliant speech. I hope I can live up to the expectations. And a very big thank you to IQAC Bethun College, Kolkata, Dr. Shom, Principal Bethun College, Professor Krishna Roy, and convener of this grand initiative, Dr. Moitri Ghosh. My dimensions are a little different. We have heard <clears throat> a lot about the virus and the impact that it has for our future. But as I told you, the mental health of persons who are in the virus or around the virus is also to be taken into account. And therefore, I will take you to the journey of how best we can survive with a doable mental health so, so that we are strong enough to face the unknown dangers. Countries worldwide have obviously resorted to a whole lot of measures where social contact has been reduced to a bare minimum, for which a number of changes in our lifestyle have come about. And it is not easy to accommodate with these changes. You will agree. Changes in our workplace. We are now working from home. Change of looking after children while we are working home school environment being created, educational institutions being imparted through online. The physical presence of the teacher is nowhere around. So with these changes, I'm sure you will agree that a lot of mental health issues can come about. Therefore, what are those mental health issues that COVID-19 has arisen in our lives? It is not only the person who has the COVID, but people around facing the COVID environment have to make a lot of adjustments 
how about are we going to make about these adjustments so that our psychological wellness and well-being is maintained and we can be as productive as possible that is the whole idea so i would like to share some of the points uh, through my slides and i will explain and take you through the journey of these slides because i don't want to be out of focus uh, while i talk about psychological wellness and well being and these are what i have gathered so that today we can be as effective as human beings fighting combating the virus so mental health issues during the lockdown and new dimensions in mental health in india and the world so we are to remain healthy at home come what may and in order to do this we have some very important salient tips which will help us remain healthy at home be it with the covid or not with the covid we are to be informed we are to remain informed so ne we have to be choosy about our media consumption it is better that we restrict to the body the information at the rate who rather than scrolling down each and every media that comes our way secondly to have a routine since we are at home home sweet home so it's very difficult to have this routine but conscientiously if we figure out a routine which we can follow while we are indoors obviously our productivity is not going to be arrested in the sense that we have a routine for waking up we have a routine of eating healthy foods our physical activity is also restricted so we are going to uh, you know be lacking our energy and therefore we exercise with a routine we sleep on time so that's the kind of routine that we need to follow not only as adults but also if we have children and young children at home because they are also attending a whole lot of online classes and the routine would help them structure their lifestyle minimize on news feeds it's very important that we minimize news feeds because if we are listening to a whole lot of news without screening the important ones from the not so important ones then we are straining our mental well being our psyche and we are unable to concentrate we are unable to do a task and complete it on time therefore mindfulness would also be lacking of course we are not supposed to keep social contact thanks to the digital social contact we must make use of the digital social contact with our loved ones and cultivate our relationships as much as before because cultivating personal relationships working on social networks are important life skills that help us to move ahead in life in spite of whatever comes our way positive adjustment we are to positively adjust with the virus avoiding alcohol and drug use if we are on alcohol and on drugs then we are negatively adjusting to the corona virus and treatment outcomes with alcoholics also becomes very very questionable screen time it is very important to keep to time even if we are 
on screen. We have, we must have a regular time frame and not the entire 24 hours being spent over the screen. So it's a good idea to be healthy at home. Of course, we are getting a lot of advice about our physical health, to wash our hands, to maintain social distancing, to try to increase our immunity, but the psychological well-being is also to be advised upon. Because after all, the psychological well-being is a very important component of the physical well-being. I'm sure everyone is going to agree on that. Managing our mental health issues. The coronavirus itself is a stress. No doubt about that. The virus itself is stressful. Whether it is a known danger, whether it is uh, an, un an unknown danger, stress is stress. And the fear, the worry, the apprehension about dealing with stress increases the crisis. So th that is an important mental health issue. We have our routines disrupted. Our routines are definitely disrupted. There is lack of employment in the coronavirus. We are amidst the coronavirus. But for every calamity, there is always a big picture waiting for us. Later on, obviously the corona is going to get over like every other distress. Keeping this in mind will give us the mental strength to cope with the virus. It is going to come to an end, come what may. We are to be selective about our media consumption. We are to focus on things that we can control. Now we can control our own personal hygiene. We can control to maintain a social distance. Any distress, during any distress, if we focus on things which are within our control, we are much more focused and strategized in facing the stress. So more or less, our focus has to be task oriented. Neither can it be extremely emotional, nor can it be extremely avoidant in nature. We have to focus on those things, or rather we have to use those strategies which will help us control. Practice healthy coping skills. So uh, practicing healthy coping skills is mostly to be very task oriented in our coping skills. We obtained all so much of information, so much of exhaustive information about uh, the coronavirus and its impact and the infrastructure from our brilliant previous speakers. So that is one way of coping with the, with the corona, by obtaining valid information. Only then can we learn to prioritize as to what are we supposed to do and what are we not supposed to do. Thank you so much. India falls prey of a mental health crisis. The social economic fissures exposed by the pandemic will result in mass unemployment, depleted social safety nets, starvation, increase in gender-based violence, homelessness, alcoholism, loan defaults, and millions slipping into poverty. The, this post-COVID landscape will be a fertile breeding ground for an increase in chronic stress, anxiety, depression, alcohol dependence, and even self-harm. The corona 
continues to take lives across the world, there's another public health crisis that's rearing its ugly head. I would like to point on that. This new danger may perhaps unleash more death and despair than the coronavirus itself. Going by the history of pandemics and the knock-on effects of an inevitable economic downturn, India is looking at a mental health crisis with suicide-related deaths as its lead indicator. We need to caution ourselves on this aspect. It is true that the statistics that are showing even in countries like Nepal, there are more suicidal deaths than corona deaths. This needs to be looked into. Of course, a lot is being, doing, uh, is being done in the southern states where digital psychiatry by the name Hans has already been organized to give solace and peace to those who are hugely troubled by the corona. And mental health obviously takes a toll even higher during times of crisis. This is how mental health works. And mental health and mental ill health are not two separate dichotomies. That is very important for us to remember. We are on a continuum. At any point of time, we may fall prey of mental ill health. However, the picture is not so bleak. If we resort to resilience. Now, resilience is proven several times by research. A nature of a person who is able to bounce back in the face of stress and adversity. The person who is capable of self-reflection, the person who is capable to seek comfort in a confidant, the person who is able to make positive life adjustments in the face of stress is said to be resilient. And it is not so difficult to be resilient. It is not a trait which is in the minority. Of course, Bengali literature tells us Robindranath was resilient. He was known also as Resilient Robi because he faced so many adversities and yet bounced back in the face of stress. Resilience can be maintained if we have the three resources of resilience. One, I can. Two, I am. And three, I have. If we can build on these, our mental strength will be in place. Be it corona or no corona, we will be able to tackle this peacefully. With that, I end my speech and I would like to congratulate Bethune College for its excellent ranking. And I would also like to thank the principal of the college, Professor Krishna Roy, coordinator of IQAC, Dr. Komal Kanti Shom, and Dr. Moitri Ghosh for inviting me digitally on this, plan on this panel with such esteemed panelists. Thank you very much. I would like to interact if there would have been any questions. Thank you so much, ma'am. It was a wonderful talk, and we had a lot of study uh, dealing with our mental health. And I think now it is time that we open uh, our questions for this uh, question-answer session. And um, I would
the questions as it as they came to me. Uh, but due to paucity of time, we would limit our questions. So um, in the chat box, the chat box uh, has been flowing with uh, questions for all the three speakers. But um, may I start with Professor Bhattacharya, please? But if any one of the panelists also wants to answer the question, they are most welcome. Uh, this question uh, came for uh, the Bhattacharya though. Is the virus temperature sensitive? If so, how is it showing havoc in Indian summer? This is one. The first question was um, whether it is temperature sensitive. Temperature sensitivity yeah. is uh, any uh, organic activity. And enzymatic activity, say. It, there, have, there are three cardinal temperatures minimum, optimum, and maximum. Uh, mi below minimum, it cannot act. Beyond maximum, it cannot act. And the optimum temperature is that of the body temperature. The virus enters the body and, my, and propagates within the body. So the body temperature is its uh, optimum temperature. There, therefore, of course, if the temperature, if the virus is exposed to very high temperature outside the outside in say sunlight over a metal panel in 44 degrees Celsius. Of course, it will be inactivated, but it enters your body. Your body is, uh, if you're healthy, your body is, uh, is, is programmed in such a way that whatever the external temperature is, inside your temperature is a normal temperature, which is normal for the virus as well. So there is no problem for the virus, even if the external, even if the uh, uh, atmospheric temperature increases, it, might, it propagates in your body. You have to remember that. Next question. Okay. okay. So maybe this is a kind of related question. Like uh, somebody has asked, is it correct that different parts of the globe are affected by the same type of virus? If a vaccine is kind of invented, then will it be equally effective in every country? This is a very interesting question. I, I, I was to go up on that point, but that was because of the paucity of time I could go. Uh, it has been found that the mutations are different globally. Mutations on the RNA dependent RNA polymerase, the enzyme which is responsible for replication of its RNA shows different kinds of mutation. China mutation is of one kind, the Lombardy mutation is of another kind, the US mutation is of another kind. I, I, I don't have much idea about the Indian mutation, but the mutations are different kind. The in case of, uh, if, I, if you compare the mortality, the mortality is least in China mutation. Mortality is highest in Lombardy mutation. So it has, of course, mutations, uh, mutations uh, uh, varied mutations <coughs> in the bones of the world. That's why it is, it is highly problematic to treat with a common protocol, treat the virus on a common protocol basis. It has mutations, differential mutations. Maybe we have mutations in its RNA dependent on polymer aside, uh, which weakens the virus. That's why our uh, mortality rate is not that high, uh, given the fact that the economically health wise, the, the, we are posed with such situations that mortality rate should be very high, but it is not that high. Maybe we have mutations which makes the virus a little less virulent. Okay. And somebody has asked whether uh, the novel coronavirus has any link to the Nipah virus. Any? Any link, link to with that of the Nipah virus? Like? NYPA. NYPA. So is it NIPA or NIPA? Or oh, NIPA, 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 NIPA virus. It, is it? No, it doesn't have any link with NIPA virus. It does have uh, a spike similarity with that of the, uh, as I said, HIV is. It has similarity with that of the Ebola. It has that of the hepatitis C virus, but uh, it doesn't have. It is. It is actually the problems are coming with plus RNA viruses. The havocs which are recently being made, the pandemics which are being caused are all plus RNA viruses. You know, 
the RNA viruses and in the hominids, the pandemics are not new. As much as 8% of our genome is resident viruses who had entered over the last 50,000 years in our body, caused havoc, and became resident on our genome. So, uh, so the RNA viruses, they are restriction, they are ret actually retro transport transposons, they have retroviral activity, uh, but uh, there may be a chance, maybe, that among the blast RNA viruses, some kind of recombination has take, is taking place. That's why <laughs> repeatedly the coronaviruses, the SARS, MARS, and now SARS-CoV-2 are becoming virulent. And one thing I can, I, I, I can pretty foresee that this is not the last. There will be various other incidences of similar recombinations. That is the most dangerous weapon in its arsenal. Thank you so much, Sister Bhattacharya. Uh, okay, Dr. Dosto wants to say something. I just wanted to add a little bit to, to that question, to the answer, basically of uh, saying that, uh, you know, if you have a mutation, whether the vaccines are going to work at all or not. I mean, uh, actually, to be honest with you, uh, uh, you know, whenever you are looking at vaccines, and I mean, there are different types of vaccines which are produced. And if you look at the type of candidate vaccines which are being given, which are being, uh, which are being tried uh, over and over again for different diseases, they all, they all initially come up with a blanket vaccine. We call it a blanket vaccine. And what does that mean? That means that it actually caters to the, it caters to the vaccine on a blanket. And later on, when the subtypes of the subserotypes, when they are identified and they are, they are found, to be prevalent more and more uh, in a different part. Say, for example, the flu vaccine. If you're looking at the flu vaccine, it's updated every year because of the fact, you know, the configuration of the flu viruses and the distribution of the flu viruses also keep on changing in the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere. So the vaccines, whatever vaccine is going to come now, there are different types. You are getting this adenovirus type uh, 5 vector. You are getting this LNP encapsulated mRNA vaccine. There are some inactivated vaccines which are being tried. There are vaccines which are being tried with a full length recombinant SARS CoV 2, glycoprotein nanop nanoparticle vaccines. So there are different types of vaccines. And each vaccine will have its deficits. But I'm pretty sure that they will be modulated depending on the place where they're going to be used. And that usually happens with viruses, especially the RNA virus vaccines. So I, I wouldn't be terribly worried about the fact that, you know, first of all, you need an envelope vaccine, and then we can go on and think about uh, the subtle bits and pieces. Now for Dr. Dosto, there is a question, which I find to be really interesting. Now, uh, is a complete lockdown essential to stop community spread of this novel coronavirus? India is already in this like long uh, months of lockdown. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I was dreading this question. <laughs> this is a question I wouldn't love to answer. But I'll be very honest with you. You know, see, you see, when you are talking about a lockdown, what is what is the rationality of a lockdown? That there will no there'll be no spread whatever within a contained society. So if a society is like a room where there are fifty people, there will be no spread between those fifty people. That is the concept of a lockdown. In other words, inside the room, inside the country, there will not be spread. That's why you are preventing the mixing of a, a population with another population inside the boundaries of the country. But the problem with countries such as, with diverse, you know, uh, structures such as ours, it is very, very easy to do in New Zealand. They could have done better in England. They didn't. They could have done, they, they did it so wonderfully in South Korea. Why is it? Because of the fact that the, the borders are absolutely sealed. Our borders are the most porous borders in the world, other than the Mexico-American border. So you see, <laughs> people are dropping in from everywhere, you know, and there is no containment. Initially, what happened is people came in. They were just sent into home quarantine without any sort of feedback, nothing. No tests were done. So what we did, we diluted the whole effort. Then there was no removal of those, uh, you know, the migrants. Initially, the center said that the state has to take care of the migrants. The state said yes, but they didn't do it. So migrants were not put. Now the migrants have to be sent home. And now when they are being sent home, they are spent 
they're spreading. So it's difficult. I'm not trying to blame anybody. What I'm trying to say is a failure of lockdown in our country is because of two reasons. One is because of the diverse population and inadequate plans and programs and possibly preparation of the lockdown. That wasn't there. But you're right. The lockdown can definitely contain the virus. Mind you, the word contain is very important. It can contain the virus spread, but it cannot stop the virus. It cannot, the containment time or the lockdown time can only make your state or your country prepare for the worst. That's all you can do. You cannot stop the cycle of the chain. You cannot do it in a country such as ours. In New Zealand, yes, it's possible. Because you, know, you can hardly see people on the street. You will see more sheep rather than people. So yes, you can do a containment there, but you can't do it in our country. It's very difficult. So when the endemic curve is rising for the country, we are now unlocking. So all our efforts of lockdown has gone into vain. No. I wouldn't say no. There are two that advantages. Is, yeah. Number one, this has been a rehearsal. This has been a rehearsal for the greater time. We have learned a different way of living life. And that is very important. I'm sure some of us will retain this, the, this features. You go to Southeast Asia anyway, even before the uh, corona came over, people used to wear masks. So we are learning. So that's number one. Secondly, it was a test of our health infrastructure. And India has not responded excellently. But yet it has done whatever it could in this limited time. So definitely that's one thing. And number three, it has brought people together. As Madam Ranjana said, you know, it has brought people together. You know, that is very important. You get together, you get, get to work on a single footing together. That's a very important, a unanimity of effort was there. And that is very important, which has happened. So masks are becoming parts and passes of our lives. Absolutely. Masks, social distancing and also refraining from things which people normally we used to indulge in, you know. I don't know if the fish markets are going to be less crowded later on in the future. I'm pretty sure they will not. But at least we have received a warning and a big warning sign. The pollution levels have gone down. Surprisingly, that's a fantastic thing which has happened. So let's talk good. Let's prepare. Let's, you would have thought, you know, if we had a world war, what would have happened? Everything would have gone in a day, you know. But this hasn't happened in a day. It has, it has given us time to prepare for the catastrophe. Some countries have done very good in containing it. We need to learn from them and we need to rehearse. And uh, there's a question uh, for you, Dr. Dotto. What age groups of children are most vulnerable to COVID infection? What is the global scenario of COVID infection among children? That's a very, very good question. Once again, I'm a pediatrician myself. So... Um, I always uh, wondered that uh, why are children not getting affected? Actually, to be honest with you, the incidence in children is very, very less. And that's a bad thing. You know why? Because of the fact that most of the children who get affected, not that they are not affected, they are affected. But most of them, 90% of them are silent carriers. So they'll bring the virus. They will not suffer from it. They will not exhibit anything other than a little bit of runny nose. And ultimately, they'll disseminate it to so many people. And remember, children's rate of infectivity is far more. They can spread far more because they don't have hygiene, number one. They mix prolifically, number three. People are much more, uh, you know, they would love to caress and care. Number four is the secretions produced by a child is far more. It's about six times more than what an adult produces. So the chances, and they, you know, they go into many play groups, schools. There are lots of places where children intermingle. So the spread is rampant. You see, the difference that we see nowadays is now my phone calls of children getting acutely ill have, have dropped down. Why is that? It's not because the pollution has gone. It's not because of that only. It's because of the fact that children are not going to schools. They are not mixing, going to care centers. They are not mixing with other children. So not, they are not getting infected. In other words, children are super spreaders, but they don't suffer a lot. Mortality in children is very low. Not that children haven't died. Yes, they have. A few children have died. In fact, there have been a documentation of a small baby in uh, Ahmedabad who was uh, as small as 18 days who was uh, affected by COVID. Okay, so, but the fact is, surprisingly, and once again, we know the morphology of the virus, but we don't know the behavior of the virus. We don't know what makes these children so, not uh, so susceptible uh, as adults. 
uh, I want to add that one, one theory is that, that they, children do not exhibit the ACE2 receptor that much that, as, as that of the adults. So that is why it is not uh, uh, the virus cannot bind to the receptor of the alveoli. And that is one theory because virus, apart from this ACE2 receptor site, has other sites by which it can also enter the cell. So one is not very clear about uh, the, the fact that uh, why the children uh, are suffering less. But uh, probably the SARS-CoV-2, is its killer weapon is uh, the, uh, its spike. And the spike receptor is lesser in amount in the children uh, alveoli. That's why children uh, suffer less. That's but the recent the recent study the recent studies are saying that the infectability in children is far more due to their GI process. They are spreading their virus in the stools more than a month after the infection of the of the virus, which is surprisingly very 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 strange because it disappears. This virus being a predominantly upper respiratory virus, a uh, commensal of the upper respiratory virus, but going in and becoming more pathologic in the lower respiratory virus. But mm. definitely, the virus resides, so a more needs to be done, actually. In China, they have seen about 118 children who were affected initially. All of them were positive in their stools at the end of a month. So that's a very bad thing. Remember, children's stools are not disposed of properly. So that's another bad thing. So children are actually super spreaders. But fortunately, they are uh, you know, saved by the Almighty. Okay, uh, one last question for uh, Dr. Dotto. Um, maybe uh, Professor Bhattacharya might also answer for this. Like we see asymptotic uh, responses among people, like somebody has got COVID, but there is no symptom uh, of actually uh, what we know about uh, the symptoms of COVID. So what to do about that? Or we don't know that we have COVID. So then what is the response? What could be the thing to do? You see, uh, we say that, you know, the infection control procedures which are in place, which I deliberately ignored because everybody has heard about them so many times on the TV. I didn't uh, want to complicate the talk. But basically, you should understand one thing. In an endemic situation, and especially when, we, when there is community transmission, let's not debate the fact whether there is community transmission at all or not. We know if we have got two and a half lakhs, in our country, there is definitely some community transmission going. Okay, so if that is it, the first thing is you have to understand and you have to realize that each and every person who is around you is possibly a community spreader. And therein lies your safety guidelines. Your use of masks, and the mask should not be hanging here. It should be there. <laughs> if possible, it should be a medical mask and not a handkerchief. And not this, as has been always said. No, this is not enough. Because when you are coughing, you are sneezing, you are spending, you are sending the viruses out. Also, when you are exhaling. So if you are breathing out also, you are sending your viruses in loads. So definitely this is a big thing. Hand washing, rigorously hand washing, over and over again. Be aware of the fact that the person who is sitting next to you may be a silent spreader. So, but in Bengali, we say that we have to 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 say that we very recent, two or three days ago, there was an ICMR report that 30% of the population, 30% of the urban, they have uh, scrutinized. They are actually asymptomatic carriers. So asymptomatics are those in which the antibody response might not have occurred at all. In, in, with SARS-CoV, with coronavirus, the development of antibody takes time. It is, a, it is, a, it is its intubation period is high. And many of the persons who, uh, who have suffered for a shorter period of time have lesser antibody response. Um, I don't percentage, Professor Bhattacharya, I don't uh, think the percentages are right because of the fact that I'll tell you why. Because in most of the countries, of the European countries also, asymptomatic rates are more than 
30% is because of the fact that it depends on who you are testing. You are testing ah. only about ah, one ah, in... Yes, yes. That's what I'm doing. Arakta Jini Shoche, Jay Shetakya 30%, Amla Jay Testa Kochi RT-PCR. That is only got a 30%, uh, that has got 30% negative test. I mean, in other words, you will be falsely, falsely negative. So basically, that's the reason when we are doing any operation in any hospital now, we are doing our RT-PCR. Because we do not know, we, we cannot isolate people now. So it's individualistic and we will have to learn to live with this virus. There's no way out until some vaccine comes. More asymptomatic is, more it will take time to develop a heart immunity. As simple as that. Definitely. Definitely. Asymptomatic thugbe, toto, jada symptoms nay, tade, tada, tara symptomatic for the show my name. ইন্ডাস্ট্রিটা <laughs> করবে <laughs> স্কুল <laughs> and is that we need to add korte chai ma'am je mane we are working mothers we have children at home our teaching uh, pattern has changed we have to do all the household chores and then uh, do online teaching which is a paradigm shift for us for our children it is again a paradigm shift my child does not uh, is completely uninterested in doing uh, like sort of uh, online classes so uh, এই পুরো জিনিসটার মধ্যে আই ফিল স্ট্রেস মাই সান ফিল স্ট্রেস অ্যান্ড আই থিঙ্ক মোস্ট অফ দ্য মাদার্স আউট দেয়ার উড হ্যাভ দ্য সেম কাইন্ড অফ অ্যাগেনি উই হ্যাভ অল বিকাম অ্যাগেনি মাদার্স সো হাউ ক্যান বি ট্যাকল অল দিস মাই ফার্স্ট পয়েন্ট উড বি টু ওরিয়েন্ট আর সেলফস টুওয়ার্ডস পজিটিভ প্যারেন্টিং হোয়েদার দ্য করোনা ইজ দেয়ার অর নট দেয়ার ইফ ইউ আর ওরিয়েন্টেড উইথ পজিটিভ প্যারেন্টিং practices i think we can tackle any storm whether it is the world war or whether it is corona so as i said as mothers in fact i would say it has been a blessing in disguise with working mothers going out of the house there are more cases of separation anxiety that statistics has come down now come what may the mother is physically present with the child it makes a lot of difference and the attachment the attachment emotion that we know of is extremely 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 crucial during the toddler stage so corona has brought the mother and child together and this togetherness has brought about more meaning in the child's life we have to dot this in our calendars and see to it that we spend more time with our children and now digital learning has become extremely enriching for children many schools are even doing football virtually so uh, channelizing the energies channelizing the mental constructivism is happening digitally to a great extent we all have to be on the lookout and make the best out of the situation and i will again repeat about being resilient if the mother practices resilience the child is automatically going to pick up there is no doubt about that the agony is in the initial stages because there is a change once we get used to the change we will accommodate with the changed lifestyle that is the human pattern 
and the brain is also programmed accordingly. Yes. Uh, Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much, so very much, ma'am. Um, now uh, I would I would thank all in today's seminar, and have they have their lecture have uh, enlightened us a lot. And therefore, on behalf of Bethel College Kolkata and the internal quality assurance itself, I thank all our esteemed guests and our respected principal, Professor Krishna Roy. I thank Professor Mul Kanti Shom, Coordinator IQAC, Dr. Amita Kaur, PCS, and all respected members of IQAC for their sincere effort. I thank Dr. Shashwat Silaha, Dr. Shubhpa Dotto, Dr. Shona Ganguly for all round and constant support. My sincere thanks to Mr. Akash Mundol of Brain Block for providing all possible technical support. Last but definitely not the least, I extend my sincere thanks to all the participants of this webinar, without whom this webinar was never possible. Thank you so much. Thank you.